go ahead. Okay, thank you. And I'm sorry if you showed up to see Philip Bullock and you got me instead. Um, so uh, thank you all for being here. It's uh, so great to, to see you all. And I'm very grateful to the organizers. Um, uh, as much as I would have loved to be in Italy with all of you, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to present virtually. So I will share my screen. I have a rudimentary PowerPoint here. Okay. Okay, so I also, this is the beginning of a, a new line of research for me, as my incredibly broad title may suggest. This is just a, a small line of, of where I'm hoping to go um, with larger projects. So I'm very um, open to any, um, uh, I'm looking forward to any questions or suggestions for, for the research. In an 1855 travelogue, the monk Parfini recounts the difficult journey to John the Forerunner Monastery in Ottoman Macedonia. The terrain was rough and dry, the flora unfamiliar. The Russo-Moldavian monk saw olive trees and the magnificent cypress trees for the first time. When he and his company uh, stopped in a village for directions, he had trouble discerning them as they were given in Serbian. When he finally reached the monastery, which stood above a great precipice like a sparrow's nest, he was glad to be greeted in Bulgarian, making communication with the hospitable abbot easier. When he entered the church for evening service, quote, the canonarchs all sang decorously in the Greek language, just as they read. We stood through the entire Vespers, he writes, but we did not understand anything, close quote. The monastery just outside of present-day Ceres, Greece, is one of many dotting the path from Russia to Parafini's goal, Mount Athos, the seat of Orthodox monasticism. Appearing in the year of Emperor Nicholas I's death, the travelogue was a capstone for the era in which Imperial Russia began to cultivate an interest in its historical ties to Byzantium. It is also a harbinger of how this historical interest would continue to evolve alongside political realities over the, the preceding generations. The late imperial period was an era of what Michael Kanichika has called elective antiquities, and the Balkans offered three particularly potent categories to draw upon as Russians sought to define their identities internally and alliances abroad. In the borderlands of the Ottoman, Austro-Hungarian, and Russian empires, most inhabitants were Orthodox in religion, ethnically a majority were Slavs, and politically, these lands were the territory once claimed by the Byzantine Empire. In the period framed by the Russian-Turkish War of 1877 to 1878 and the First World War, three ideologies paralleled these categories. Pan-Slavism emphasized ethnic alliances across imperial boundaries. Pan-Orthodoxy sought alliance on the basis of religion and Translatio Imperii sought to transcend ethnic, national, and religious divisions, envisioning Imperial Russia as the inheritor of Byzantium's diverse cosmopolitan empire. Into this milieu stepped Stepan Smolensky. One of the founding figures of Russian medieval musicology, Smolensky had held posts in Kazan, Moscow, and St. Petersburg, including as the director of the Moscow Sonato School of Church Singing and the St. Petersburg Court Capella, the two institutions most responsible for the revival of church music that flowered in the late imperial period. A leading expert in chant paleography, Smolensky long harbored an interest in visiting the South Slavic lands to fill gaps in the musical historiography. This wish would come true in 1906, when he retraced the path established by the monk Parfini decades earlier from the imperial capital of St. Petersburg to Mount Athos. In addition to pilgrim, there, pilgrims, there were scholarly precedents for Smolensky's journey. Most famously, Nikodim Kondakov, the founder of modern icon studies, tread much of the same ground in his archaeological travels to Macedonia and Mount Athos. In fact, Smolensky sought Kondakov's advice prior to his Athos expedition, and he enjoyed many of the same imperial funding sources and diplomatic contacts. Recent scholarship has demonstrated that Kondakov and other archaeologists, such as Nikolai Marr, 
put historical evidence toward a narrative of translatio imperium, focusing on pluralism and cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism in a rejoinder to 19th century nationalism. Smolensky, faced with patchwork evidence, was seeking his own historiographical paradigm to make sense of it, and both uh, pan-Slavic and pan-Orthodox persuasions had their appeal. Influenced in part by the politics of his patron, chief procurator of the Holy Synod, Konstantin Pobiednosov, as well as an energetic Bulgarian student, Smolensky expected to uncover a pre-modern Slav Orthodox utopia in the manuscripts and monasteries of the Balkans. It is difficult to disentangle the political and scholarly origins of Smolensky's interest in South Slavic chant. In his memoir, he recalls feeling the pull of the Russo-Turkish war, wishing to assist in the Slavic cause uh, when he was working as a singing teacher in Kazan. Instead, he turned his attention to Slavic chant paleography. With a few, within a few years, this too drew his interest to the Balkans. Russian manuscripts from the 16th century onward contain inscriptions naming individual chant melodies as Greek, Bulgarian, or Serbian, and Smolensky wished to excavate what he called the musical coloring of these melodies in the countries whose names they bore. At stake here was more than Smolensky's aesthetic interest. The field of medieval musicology was in its infancy in Russia, and the relationship between Byzantine influence and autochthonous uh, Slavic musical elements was still unclear. The national labels found in Russian manuscripts seemed to indicate a path of transmission, but their late appearance and integration into Russian manuscripts raised questions about provenance and antiquity. No stop along the manuscript trail brought epistemological and political issues to the fore more than Bulgaria. The first Slavic kingdom to adopt Christianity, Bulgaria's brief, excuse me, uh, Bulgaria's brief period of political independence ended in 1018 when it was absorbed into the Byzantine Empire before its rule was passed over to the Ottoman Empire in 1393. The Bulgarian lands were the focus of pan-Slavic efforts surrounding the Russo-Turkish War, which resulted in their independence, though with unstable borders. In the Russian press, a parallel was drawn between the so-called Turkish yoke and the Mongol yoke that Russia had once borne, a narrative that inspired Russian musicians and scholars to assist in the longer process of liberating Bulgaria's church music. Smolensky took on a Bulgarian student named Alexander Nikolov, whose painstaking work on Bulgarian chant renewed Smolensky's own interest in a Balkan expedition. It is also in the study of Bulgarian church music that the often complementary ideologies of pan-Orthodoxy and pan-Slavism entered into dramatic conflict. This is due in part to the Ottoman millet system in which communities were defined by religious confession rather than ethnicity or territory. This meant the Orthodox Church in Bulgaria was under direct control of the Greek Patriarchate in Istanbul. The Turkish yoke for Bulgarian nationalists and sympathizers was thus also the Greek or Phanaric yoke. In 1872, the eve of political liberation of Bulgaria, the Bulgarian Church declared autocephaly, resulting in the declaration of a schism by the Patriarch of Constantinople. While the Bulgarian question put pan-Slav and pan-Orthodox ideologies in Russia at loggerheads, the influence of Nikolov and the popularity of chants like Blaga Obrazny Yosif, harmonized famously by Alexander Turchininov, pushed church music circles decisively in the pan-Slav direction. Nikolai Kampanyevsky, a composer of sacred music and a strident polemicist, argued that Ottoman, the Ottoman Greek phanariots had mercilessly Hellenized Bulgarian church music over the years with gold crosses on their chests and satanic politics. He writes even of a devastating 1838 library fire in Teranov as an attempt to uproot all traces of the previous culture of the Bulgarian kingdom that could bear witness to the past brilliant, free, uh, con brilliant condition of free Bulgaria including the remnants of manuscripts of Bulgarian church singing. In the place of Bulgarian singing reigned what he called Constantinopolitan singing, a careful way of disentangling it from 
distinguishing it from properly Byzantine singing, whose influence he was not ready to forswear. Constantinopolitan singing, he claims, displays so-called Asiatic influences, such as intervals smaller than a semitone. Since Bulgaria's manuscripts had supposedly been burned by the Greeks, Nikolov set out to collect all Bulgarian chants he could identify in Russian manuscripts. The premise uh, was that the, when the Ottomans conquered the Bulgarian lands in the 14th century, uh, a wave of immigration to southern uh, Rus brought Bulgarian melodies with it. Nikolov tracked down melodies in archives and private collections with the goal of creating the entire, an entire liturgical circle of Bulgarian chants to be adopted for liturgical use in Bulgaria. Through melodic analysis, he was also able to identify several chants as Bulgarian that were previously believed to be Kievan, a seemingly small find that nevertheless hinted at a deeper substrate of Bulgarian influence. Upon publishing the first volume of, of his collection, Nikolov wrote an article in the Russian Musée Gazette entreating Russian composers to use the melodies he's transcribed as the basis for new harmonizations and choral compositions. Kampanyevsky answered this call composing a Bulgarian liturgy which received glowing reviews. Nikolov relished its success, writing that all Bulgarian chant will be the final blow struck against the common Slavic historical enemy, the Greek. It should occupy that place in the Bulgarian church, which is currently illicitly occupied by Greek Constantinopolitan singing. The historical significance of the research, however, remained an open question. If Bulgarian chant made its way to Russia in 14th through 16th centuries, when was this repertoire originally created? Does it represent a native Slavic chant tradition that predates Byzantine influence? To answer these questions, Smolensky would have to travel to Bulgaria and the Slavic monasteries of Mount Athos. Upon departing St. Petersburg in 1906, Smolensky's first stop was Vienna. In his Impressions Along the Road, later printed in Russian Musical Gazette, he writes of visiting the graves of Beethoven, Schubert, and Mozart and seeing the Vienna Hofbauer perform the magic flute under Mahler's baton. We have nothing like it, he wrote enviously. He also visited the large Orthodox church near the Russian consulate, which served local Slavs and visiting Orthodox Christians throughout the, throughout the region. Here you can always see the marvelous national attire of the Macedonians, Montenegrins, Bosnians, Serbs, Bulgars, as well as Ergo-Russians, Bukovinians, and so on. In the Viennese church, they are all united together in the church Slavonic and in their familiar native liturgy. His admiration for this pan-Slavic Orthodox community under Russian leadership is mixed with disappointment. The only music heard in the church was a small all-male choir of six to eight Czech Catholics and choristers from the local opera. The Russian colony, he writes, should have understood the significance of its position and supported a suitable choir for the joy and consolation of all Orthodox Slavs in Vienna. The next stop was Belgrade. During his brief stay, uh, Smolensky observed that Serbian monophonic chant is by its foundation, uh, the foundation of its discipline, doubtlessly Greek. But the Serbs managed to insert into the Greek melodies so many of their own that Serbian Orthodox singing might already be considered a sufficiently independent art form, although at its fundamental roots, it belongs to the grammar of Greek singing. This is in keeping with Serbian historiography of the time, which argued that the Serbian nation had adopted and improved Byzantine, cult uh, his Byzantine culture independently of its institutional heir, the Ottoman Greek Patriarchate. From Belgrade, Smolensky proceeded to Sofia, his second time in the city. He was disappointed to find almost no written evidence of early Bulgarian chant. On his first trip in 1897, Smolensky had written to Pobiednos that in most of the large churches he heard primarily chant harmonizations by his own pre-predecessor at the court capella, Nikolai Bakhmietiv, um, in a style that he, Smolensky, had fought hard against in Russia in recent years. Only in the villages is ancient chant heard, but in the music's, uh, but the music's easily perceptible connection to native antiquity uh, 
was torn to pieces by contemporary performance practice. However, he also notes the presence of certain Bulgarianisms in the Greek chant heard, particularly in churches where singers sang from memory. These suggested to him the quote, livingness of the Bulgarian musical essence, to the musical nature to this day, close quote. Likewise, when he returned a decade later, he wrote that the Bulgarians, like the Serbs, cannot avoid inserting a multitude of Slavic sounds into the chant imposed upon them. Again, kindling hope that this was an older tradition shining through. Between Smolensky and the Holy Mountain lay only a chaotic stopover in Istanbul. He notes the less than warm welcome from the Greek patriarch and his staff. Much more helpful was Fyodor Uspinsky, the antiquities expert who ran the Russian Archaeological Institute in Constantinople, an institution that was influential both in the booming field of archaeology and as a nexus of Russian soft power within the Ottoman capital. Uspinsky had himself taken part in archaeological travels with Kondakov and remained a crucial supporter of such efforts. At last, Smolensky landed on the peninsula of uh, Athos and established the Russian monastery of Pantelemon as his home base. He took three trips around the peninsula, visiting as many monasteries and skeets as possible in search of ancient Slavic manuscripts. After the second trip, he writes, it became clear that our hopes of discoveries of Slavic chant were unrealizable. In his published travelogue, Smolensky minimizes his disappointment at the absolute dearth of Slav manuscripts, but in private correspondence, he is in a state of near crisis. While Nikolov and the community of the Bulgarian and Serbian monasteries, Zograf and Hilander, insist that this is due to foul play on the part of the Greeks, Smolensky himself is increasingly skeptical of this view. Confronted with the lack of evidence, he makes the reasonable conclusion that the South Slavs did not develop a separate written uh, chant tradition. On the other hand, Smolensky had found what he called an embarrassment of riches of Greek manuscripts, Greek, Greek manuscripts from the Middle Byzantine period. It was to these that Smolensky would now look rather than a fabled Slavic, South Slavic source as the direct predecessor of the manuscripts of Kievan and Muscovite Rus. He made extensive copies of these manuscripts for further analysis, but in the meantime, he drew upon the living history around him to help conceptualize this new historical narrative. Smolensky was primed to dislike the music of the Greek monasteries. The Neo-Hellenic singing he heard contrasted with this, the corpus of so-called Greek chant that was integrated into Russian church singing. Kampanyevsky and Nikolov had both referred to this music as Greek howling. To be sure, in Athos and along the way, he heard Greek singing that in his accounting contained unpleasant nasal vocal production and vain soloistic singing, which included indulgent melismata and nonsense syllables. But he also encountered singers like an auspiciously named monk, Chrysostom, who left a much more positive impression. These monks sang in an austere style that was in keeping with the traditional modes, used natural intervals, and unlike Russian harmonizations, stayed away from seventh chords and leading tones. These more ancient Greek chants impressed Smolensky with the poetry of their texts, which fits so well to their melodies, heightening his sense of the translatedness of Russian hymns. His enthusiasm for these singers surpasses even that for the Russian monks of Pantelemon or the Bulgarian monks at Zograf, whose singing was nasal and words unintelligible, he wrote. Such impressions, though far from concrete historical evidence, helped Smolensky imagine a narrative in which the sounds of Neo-Hellenic chant with its supposed Turkish ornaments, as well as Russian church music with its Western harmonizations, came from a shared past. The sounds Smolensky heard on Athos also helped deconstruct some of the utopian pan-Slavist ideas that had shaped his expectations. Despite what he calls a whole labyrinth of intrigues between Greeks and Slavs politically, musically, Athos fostered intermingling. Even at the Russian Pantelemon Monastery, one chapel frequently held services in monophonic Greek chant. Other travelers, both before and after Smolensky, note similar mixtures throughout the Slavic and Greek monasteries. One even heard monks singing Dominus Eleison, 
mixing Latin and Greek in a Romanian skeet. Smolensky also observed that within the Russian and Ukrainian monasteries, the monks sang not in a standardized historical manner, but in a hodgepodge of regional chant variations that the monk had brought with them from Russia. These observations likely influenced Smolensky's conclusion that Athos was historically one of those orthodox international centers at which some point every artistic current from all over had come together. He considered Athos a melting pot now as well as the Byzantine era, calling it an artistic laboratory for Slavic enlightenment, where Slavs nevertheless had to submit to the mighty artistic developments of John of Damascus and other Greek singers. As time went on, he writes, the paths of Greek art and ours diverged to completely different directions, doubtlessly taking on national colors. These colors, such as the Bulgarianisms he heard on his trip, are no longer an original essence shining through Greek influence, but rather a subsequent stage of phylogeny. Although the original impetus behind Smolensky's interest in Athos and the Balkans was pan-Slavic politics, what he found on the Holy Mountain forced him to adopt a more pan-Orthodox historical view, although he stopped short of Kondakov's more eclectic outlook of Translatio Imperium. Perhaps more importantly, his experience helped him to some extent qualify the relationship between music and politics. Musical pluralism existed despite political strife on Athos. Most of all, the Athos expedition demonstrates the mutually constitutive nature of medieval and modern identity and the profound impact of 20th century imperial politics on our own concept of medieval music in the pre-modern world. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, David. The floor is now open for questions. Maria. Thank you, David, for really inspiring paper. Uh, my question is, uh, how, how quickly did this gather momentum and, and sort of infiltrate into the larger consciousness or was it sort of a niche thing that tended to just um, become centralized in certain locations? Sure, so this research is, I'm, I'm trying to situate it among a larger trend of um, sort of the national pastime for antiquities in Russia in the late 19th century. And um, I think the, um, uh, the archeological uh, society um, was, was highly publicized um, and uh, they were sponsoring expeditions all over. Kandakov, uh, as an icon collector, was was quite famous. And Smolensky and the um, the chant collectors um, really occupied a more low profile uh, role within this milieu, which which is why I think it, it's hard to you know even as a contemporary reader to sort of tease out um, their own sort of contemporary discoveries and proclivities from what has really just entered our sort of historiography of um, uh, Russian and you know Slavic um, and um, Orthodox uh, church music history. Um, so Smolensky's uh, he died a couple years after this, so he wasn't really able to uh, publish many of um, sort of his future findings. Um, but it, it was this moment was a paradigm shift for the historiography at the time. Um, there was still um, you know a few issues to be resolved. Um, uh, about the earliest sort of chant um, uh, dialects and different types of nooms and stuff like that. Um, but this was really the turning point where the sort of link to Byzantium was was solidified. Um, but yeah, in terms of sort of the broader consciousness, I, I think this um, historical research was really, really hard to disentangle from um, sort of imperial politics and um, the, the um, there were several, um, I don't have their names at my, my fingertips, but several journeys, or excuse me, journals that um, uh, really publicized these pan Slav and pan Orthodox causes. Um, and, uh, and then finally, sort of in the literary world, um, Konstantin Leontiev um, is probably the most famous example of where sort of similar ideas in, in politics um, were spilling over um, at the earlier side of this era into sort of the literary world. 
I'm sorry, how quickly did it sort of, um, did it retain this kind of historical authenticity, if that's the word we can use, um, or, or how much did it actually become a kind of creative myth, you know, because um, you could have two directions, right? You could go and research your, your history, but then then uh, how, how quickly does that stop being the aim and the aim just becomes like it's a spark for something else? Sure. Yeah. So th actually, this is something I know a little bit more about because this is closer to what my dissertation was about. But um, the um, these old chants really, um, you know, both from the Balkans and from the environs of, of Russia, um, you know, from Kivu Pechersky Lavra and um, uh, and the, the uh, monasteries of the north, um, these chants really sort of become integrated into new compositional practices. And they're often flagged as, you know, original, you know, Serbian chant or um, Sofranievsky chant. Um, but even those sources um, are highly unstable. You know, they come from these monasteries often where sort of the the type of knowledge production is not the same as that we would, um, you know, as scholars, you know, find comfortable for sort of identifying origins and and antiquity. So, um, you know, there, yeah, there is this sort of scholarly sort of um, body. There's monographs being published, scholarly articles, but yes, there's also this huge creative thing, that, um, called the new direction of uh, Russian church music, uh, where melodies, you know from Russian as well as Balkan um, uh, monasteries are being sort of integrated into um, sort of creative endeavors. Probably the most um, sort of the farthest afield it gets is this um, famous chant, Blago Brazny Yosif, is um, it's a traditional Bulgarian chant that shows up in the, the manuscripts, I think in the, the 16th century. Um, and Turchininov had harmonized it. It was quite famous amongst sort of ordinary churchgoers. Um, and uh, it also turns up in Grachininov's Passion Week cycle, which is sort of one of the, the high points of, of that early 20th century repertoire. Um, in the same, it's the only sort of authentic chant he uses, and uh, it's harmonized in a way that is highly redolent of the um, March of the Grail Knights from uh, Wagner's Parsifal. So, um, so really, it is sort of the impetus for this sort of huge creative moment. Thank you. questions or comments. So I, I have a quick question and perhaps it's a little simplistic. I mean, I mean, what are the practical ramifications of Smolensky's strips and conclusions on the actual performance of chants in Russia, the singing of chants, you know, in the early 20th century? Yeah, you know, Smolensky is, is probably most important less for his scholarship, which, you know, is foundational so much as his administrative work. Um, he ran the, um, he was uh, responsible in large part for the revival of the Sonato College in Moscow. And then he ran the Court Capella in St. Petersburg. Um, so I think his influence is probably, um, or the influence of these trips is more in sort of the sense of the networks and the pedagogical sort of relationships and, um, you know, him being able to um, sort of share information with colleagues who were directing the choir at the Sonato College. Um, uh, and uh, so it's it's sort of a diffuse um, influence. So in terms of the practical ramifications, you know, he didn't find any, um, he didn't find the manuscripts he was looking for. He made tons of um, sort of photographs of, of the middle Byzantine manuscripts, were, which were actually presumed lost until Maria, Marina Rachmanova um, published um, uh, a new collection a few years ago. They were presumed lost until then. So this particular expedition, it's more in terms of the narrative that it has sort of impacts, but sort of the broader scale um, sort of project. Um, there were other projects. Uh, uh, Dmitry Alamanov um, was another sort of uh, church music expert and um, composer who conducted a similar survey of um, manuscripts within Russia, sort of trying to centralize them. And so it, the, it's sort of a, a multi-stage process in which the sort of pupils of the Court Capello or the Sonata College learn their paleography, they sing in the choir, and these things sort of gradually um, influence one another. Thank you. Other questions or comments? All right, so thanks very much.